conservative church and it felt like you had to be a certain way. There was a, um, the things you could do, couldn't do, you had to do, you shouldn't do. It just went on and on and you're more stressing about what people think about you and um, what does the pastor or this teacher or that Bible school person want you to be or how, what you should say and act. And it's very, it was very tiring and draining and it made me self-conscious and made me feel less confident in myself and I realized that that's not at all what God had in store for me or wants for me and I just, it was so freeing to realize that being in a relationship with God and knowing Him um, is not at all about a checklist. I think to be in a relationship with God is as naturally as we think of any other relationship. It's a two-way street, it's, a, it's another person to me. Um, but it's like the most ideal, most amazing relationship that you could have because it's, he can't let you down. He's not within what we define as a normal person or with the shortcomings that our fellow friends or um, boyfriends or parents, any of these relationships that are human and earthly have. It's, it's so awesome and I know that I can de uh, depend on him and um, it means that I talk to God all the time. It's <laughs> without seeming like a crazy person. Um, I mean, we call it prayer, but really it's a conversation. And I just feel like um, my relationship with him is that I constantly talk to him. And it's, um, yeah, I don't know. It could be anywhere, anytime. You just um, get to share your deepest heart's desires, your worries, your, um, your hopes, your dreams. It's like the best friend and person that can ever hear you out. I hope that everyone gets to experience having a relationship with God because He's always there waiting for you, available, um, probably knocking on your heart with other, whether we know it or not. Um, I feel like it's such a privilege that I hope you know people don't miss out on. And it's not a religion. I, I mean, some, for some South Bears who have been going here a long time, you know, we know the language. It's not a religion; it's a relationship, and that makes it so much more real and tangible. So I just. I hope everyone will just explore what that can mean for them. Hey, welcome to Spirituality for the rest of us. We're going to have a great time together. It's going to be fun. And this whole journey in the next few weeks is all about knowing God. But you see, it's not necessarily knowing God in the way that many of us understand it. What we're going to do is we're going to challenge many of the modern day, widely accepted ways of viewing spirituality. And we're going to do this because that's what Jesus did when He came to the earth. And it's not an accident, when you look at the life of Jesus, it's not an accident that He came and He came from a backwater town, He hung out with ordinary people, He used simple illustrations to explain profound truths. Uh, it's not an accident that the New Testament of the Bible was written in simple street language Greek instead of classical Greek. Uh, it's not an accident that the people that Jesus chose to follow Him were fishermen, carpenters, uh, they were farmers, they were men and women and children who people often said, these are not spiritual enough for God. See, all of that was a part of the plan of God to make what is inaccessible, accessible to all people. And that's what this journey is going to be all about. See, when Jesus came into this world, He confronted a religious system that saw God as anything but accessible. It was for the elite for those that had a, a certain status in society, that had a certain education, that ha had a certain amount of self-discipline that was very rigid and were able to commit in a certain way to God. And then Jesus began to challenge that system. He welcomed all people to come. He welcomed all people to know God, to worship God, even the worst of sinners. And then He showed them a pathway to knowing God. God. See, religious people in our day, uh, usually out of zeal for God, a passion for God in the way that they define it, are still pushing a definition of spirituality that's contrary to the ways of Jesus. So in this journey, we're going to go back to the roots. What does Jesus say really means for us to know God? See, Jesus made things simple. He made it accessible. He offered freedom and He redefined spirituality to the rest of us. So here's what this group is designed for, this whole experience. I want to give you three categories of people that we designed this experience for. Number one is this. If you've tried the standard recipes for knowing God, 
but then you you felt like it still left you kind of empty or you know if it felt like something was still lacking then this journey is to give you hope and to give you a fresh perspective on what it means to know God. Number two is this. If you, it's for those of us that have learned to play the church game. You kind of go to weekend services and you know some of the lingo, but, but at the end of it all, in your heart, you still know that there are some doubts, some questions that you're kind of feeling weird about that you don't know how to address and you wonder in the back of your mind, does this stuff that I believe actually work? Does it, does it really produce what they say it produces? Is it really as advertised, in other words? See, in this journey, we're going to address a lot of those questions, and I think some of the answers will be surprising to you. And then lastly, uh, maybe you feel like you've mastered all of the standard spiritual disciplines that people are used to and you found them extremely helpful and they're life-giving and you feel like you got it together and it all works wonderful for you if that's you then this experience will help you understand the rest of us and so if you often feel like you're you're not all that religious you don't fit the mode you struggle with rigid disciplines you might have a hard time focusing sometimes or when you try to pray the birds singing outside distract you all the time and you feel like you you're not quite like uh, some people that you hear about somewhere in in religious world um, then I, I think you're going to really enjoy this experience and hopefully to bring new freedom to your understanding of knowing God so here's the question so what does it mean for us to know God if you ask a typical Christian that question they'll say that the big distinction of Christianity is that it's about a relationship, not a religion. But see, even though Christians say stuff like that, it often appears that we communicate to others through our language and through the way that we live, this cookie-cutter approach to knowing God. So we say that it's kind of about this relationship of freedom, but then we communicate to the world and to those around us that you have to do these exact few things if you really want to know who God is. And it's kind of confusing. See, the mistake that we make is that we focus more on the tools and the spiritual disciplines that are set to help us know God than focusing on knowing God itself. So the tools, the steps, the strategies become more important than the thing that they're meant to lead us toward which is this great relationship with God. Larry Osborne, in the book that we're studying together, he says it this way, books and conferences on the inner life end up presenting a cookie-cutter approach to spirituality that focuses more on the steps we take than on the actual quality of our walk with God. See, a lot of times we're focused on the action steps, the, the strategies, the tools, and we forget what those, all those things are meant to lead us to. And they take priority over the actual results that we're looking for. See, relationships are always complicated. And not, no two relationships are ever alike. And God wants a relationship with all of us. But he, here's the deal. It can't be found in a one-size-fits-all approach to spirituality. And that's what I, we, we want to focus on this session and even the sessions to come. It's the end result that matters. It's if something produces a great walk with God for you, then it's a great path for you to take. But ask yourself this question. Does God have favorites? Because if you're like me, sometimes you feel like this. You know, like I get people all the time that ask me these questions. Like, hey, can you... Can you pray for me because you're, you're a pastor so God might listen to you more than he listens to me or whatever it is that, that people say. See, people make it seem like, if, like God is partial to the reflective types. He's partial with those with high IQs, with great vocabularies. He's partial to those that have great self-discipline. Or God is most impressed with people that read a lot. Have you ever noticed that? Like we communicate this, like, man, that guy is super spiritual because you read so much or they, they journal this amount of times uh, a week and so forth. Or maybe people who are ordained or Bible scholars or study a certain way or priests uh, somehow they're closer to God because of their status or their position. 
And we have this tendency to communicate that, that God has favorites or He's partial to some people. But listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 25. He says this, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, for you revealed your truths to the lowly and the ignorant, the children and the crippled, the lame and the mute. You have hidden wisdom from those who pride themselves on being so wise and learned. Then later on in Matthew chapter 18, there's another incident where a disciple comes to Jesus and says, in the kingdom of heaven, who's the greatest? And then Jesus looks at him and says, uh, he, he, or actually, he, he, Jesus called over a little child. He put his hand on the top of the child's head and Jesus says, this is the truth. Unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. In that kingdom, the most humble are the most like this, and the most like this child are the greatest. So here's Jesus changing the paradigm of what it means to, to know God, what it means to listen to God. Why did Jesus often emphasize that God speaks, reveals Himself, and receives those that are like children, who are humble, who are broken, who are unschooled, who are ordinary in a lot of different uh, definitions of that word? Could it be that He was saying that all people are invited to relationship with Him without partiality? That it's not based on your status or you being able to have all these strict disciplines necessarily that helps you know who God is. Maybe it's not reserved for just a few elite type of people who are scholarly or who have a certain amount of knowledge. Maybe He's okay with our differences. Think about that. Maybe He's okay in the way that He created you. And maybe it's okay for you to to be you in your approach to knowing who God is. Maybe since relationships are never the same, He doesn't expect you and I to know Him in the same way that other people know Him. Maybe there's freedom in our approach to knowing God. See, Larry Osborne, again, in the book that we're reading, says this, that something tells me that God doesn't just put up with our differences. He savors them and adapts to them. He said it again in another uh, page, no two relationships with God will ever be exactly alike. See, right now, I have three kids, and they're all very, very unique. Lily is my oldest of the three. She's a little bit bossy. She loves structure. She doesn't like change. She's very athletic, but she likes more the structure type of sports like gymnastics and soccer. Um, She's very clingy with her belongings. She loves to read, to write, and she thrives on routine. But then I have Kaylin. Kaylin's my middle child, and she is not structured at all. In fact, she's the free-spirited child in our home. She dances randomly throughout the day. Everything is beautiful to Kaylin. She goes outside and smells the flowers. She makes up her own songs and stories. She's very giving and loose with her belongings. She likes spontaneous activities, and she thrives on flexibility. And And Kaylin is very emotional. She takes words very seriously and they're very meaningful to her. Then I have little Ephraim. Ephraim is the youngest of of my kids. He's my little boy. He is super fun, but extremely obsessive compulsive. He is creative, but he likes things to be in order. In fact, he, he started to fold his own clothes when he was two years old and all his drawers are extremely organized and he was potty trained really, really early because he hates being dirty. So he couldn't stand it. So he, we didn't even have to train him very much because he just hated being dirty. Even to this day, he, he washes his hands a lot and he doesn't like being dirty. And he's a fun little kid. But see, as a father, I understand the relationship with each of my kids look very different. For me to know them and for them to know me. We build intimacy with one another in unique ways. So Lily enjoys it when I read her a book that she already has on her bookshelf. Kaylin, she feels loved when I make up a story that I can tell her without reading it from a book. And Ephraim just likes it when I keep his bookshelf in order and don't make, it, don't make a mess out of it. They're all very unique. See, when Lily wants to, to sing, she'll memorize every word of a song before she sings it out. 
Kaylin, when she wants to sing, she makes up her own words and just kind of lets it flow out of her. See, every person is so, so unique. And when we try to copy others or, or compare or whatever else we do, we start missing out on the specific way that God created us to know Him. So I, I think that the, the point of all this is this. I want to encourage every single one of my kids to know me in the way that they're designed to, to know me. And I want to know them in the specific ways that they are. And God is the same way. He looks at us and He says, I, I created you with these personalities, with these styles and whatever else. And He wants us to know Him uh, within the way that He created us. See, you and I were designed to relate with God in unique ways. We don't have to imitate anyone else's spirituality. The end goal is a thriving relationship with Jesus. How you get there is unique to you. See, as we close our session together, I want to give you a few challenges to make the most of your experience in the coming weeks. And this is to make your, your life group experience the best that it can be and also your spirituality, your own journey in discovering who you are and how you relate to God. And so I want to encourage you to try your best to come to all the life group sessions that are to come. I want to encourage you to take a risk and open up with your group in the coming weeks as much as you feel comfortable doing so. I want to encourage you to attend and watch the Sunday messages or the weekend messages uh, at your campus. And you can do it online or come and participate in the experience on Sunday. And then lastly, just ask Jesus to speak to you and watch what He has to say. Let me pray for us. Father, I want to thank you for every single person who is participating in these groups all over Silicon Valley. I thank you that you are after us and that you've designed us to know you, to have relationship with you in a unique way. So bring freedom to that, Lord Jesus. Help us to understand you, to know you, to take steps toward having a thriving relationship with you in the coming weeks. In Jesus' name, amen.